welcome to LifeSpring Church. We hope you enjoy this message. To find out more about LifeSpring Church, head to linktr.ee forward slash LifeSpring UK. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, nice to see you. Nice to see you up there in the balcony. Hello. Nice to see you. And anybody online, um, welcome to you too. So we're looking at Joseph, and I'm carrying on from Angeline. And um, when I was thinking about this, what I wanted to start with uh, was some words of Jesus. So um, if I can have that up, that would be great. Yeah, next one. Thank you. So some wonderful words of Jesus, aren't there? Um, I have come that you may have life and have it uh, abundantly or have it to the full. And I love those words, and um, I think if I only just heard those words, I'd be, does anybody want to be a Christian? I'd be like, yeah, it sounds good, I'm coming. You know, I, I, I don't know what it is, but I want that uh, life um, that's so abundant. And um, I think it's important to think about those words, because sometimes our life, we sort of look at it and we think, these are the words of Jesus, Here's my life. Uh, Doesn't look like it's matching up somehow. Am I getting it wrong? Uh, You know, what's going on? And um, so I want to look at these words, and I want to look at the life of Joseph and see if it can throw some light on. Sometimes we have that feeling of there's a discrepancy between the two. But the other thing I think, when you have those words... Um, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. I think sometimes we interpret it as God's there to make my life a success and God's there to make my life happy. So if I can have the next slide, please. And, um, you know, I think to myself, is, is that what it is? Is God there to make, my, to make me happy? Um, you know, is he like some sort of add-on? And uh, if I let Jesus into my life, I can be me, but me on a really good day. That's, that's what it's like. I don't know if you remember that Barocca advert, the guys on the log doing this funky dance. And it's like you, but on a really good day. Is that what it is? Is that what becoming a Christian is? That, you know, it's like some sort of cosmic drink that I take and then I get wings, you know, Red Bull, and I can just fly through every storm, above every storm, sail through life. Is that what it is? Is that what it means? You know, um, or is it, you know, we have that phrase, I put that one of the guy on the cyclist, because we, maybe we don't say live life to the full, but out there we say live life to the max, you know, and it's got that idea of adventure, fun, Um, Those kind of ideas. And I know we don't necessarily say it out loud, but I think sometimes we just have this idea, becoming a Christian, uh, God has all his focus on me, and he's there to make me happy. And I've got these words of C.S. Lewis that I want to share with you. I've been reading this book. I read it every now and then, try to remember what he says. I'm not very good at remembering it half the time, but it's a really good book. And C.S. Lewis says this, what would really satisfy us would be a God who said of anything we happen to like doing, what does it matter so long as they're contented? We want, in fact, not so much a father in heaven as a grandfather in heaven. I do feel like us grandparents get a hard rap. Look at this next word, senile. I'm quite worried about that word as it is. My memory's rotten. Can I just say, grandmas don't have to be grey and have a walking stick. But anyway, moving on. Come on, grandparents. Woo! Yeah. Anyway, enough of the rant. A senile benevolence who, as they say, like to see the young people enjoying themselves and whose plan for the universe was simply that it might be said at the end of each day, a good time was had by all. Now, I know we're not blunt, blunt, and we may not blatantly say it like that, but I think sometimes, deep down, that's what we really think, and then when life does what life does, throw us lots of curved balls, 
we get a bit confused. And we can feel we've got it wrong, we're doing something wrong, God's forgotten about us. And how does this abundant life thing work? You know, it becomes a bit of a question, doesn't it? So what I want us to do is to look at this life of Joseph with that thought at your back of your mind. What's our life meant to look like? What's this abundant life meant to look like? What does following Jesus really involve? What does he really do? Who is he really like? Because when we go through it, we can really question, can't we? Uh, so sometimes it's good to do a bit of thinking now uh, to help us when we're in it. So um, I want you to track with me, and we're going to do a little bit of a whistle-stop tour through Joseph. So if I may have the next slide, please. So just a little reminder, Joseph has these dreams, and uh, they're a dream of, you know, all the... Um, uh, I can't think, that's the word, sheaf, isn't it? Sheaves of, sheaves of, I can't say that word, but basically everybody bowing down, <laughs> I'll just say that, everything bowing down to him. And in a nutshell, I'd sum that up as saying, he's having a dream where God's speaking to him and saying, you have a destiny, and it's a destiny of greatness, and it's a destiny of leadership. Yeah, And I think to myself, whoa, that sounds like abundant life. That sounds like it, doesn't it? Become a Christian. Whoa, destiny, greatness, leadership. But what happens? Well, uh, you know, if you're here last week, you'll know. He gets sold by his own brothers into slavery at the age of 17, 17 years old. And um, we get a little bit of, I think it's really good when you read the Bible to imagine it, put yourself in it, really think it through, what must it have been like? And we get some insight into um, what it was like for Joseph, because there's a moment when the brothers are talking about what they did, that they sold their own brother into slavery. They don't realize Joseph is Joseph, and they don't realize he can understand what they're saying. And they're talking to each other, and they say, we saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. So I want you to imagine Joseph. He's in absolute anguish and distress, and he's pleading with his brothers for his life, and they turn their back on him. And Psalm 105 tells us, that Joseph's feet were bruised because fetters were put on his feet and an iron collar was put round his neck. You know, he was forced to follow this Ishmaelite caravan, chained and beaten and thirsty, hungry. Nobody cares what he's feeling, what he's thinking, who he is, how unjust it is. And um, I was thinking to myself, you know, Psalm 121 wasn't written when Joseph was going through this. So, you know, I look to the hills, where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord. And I wondered how long he was looking to the horizon and thinking, they're going to turn around. They're going to come back. They're going to change their mind. Reuben wasn't with them. He'll come and rescue me. And even more so, when my father knows, my father will come. And how long was it before he stopped looking and hoping that somebody who cared about him was going to come and rescue him? And nobody came. Nobody came. And then he's in that slave market in Egypt, and pe probably naked. People are looking in his teeth, feeling his arms, bidding for him as if he's a commodity. And then he's sold into Potiphar's household and nobody came and nobody rescued him and what does he do what does he think is going on how does he marry that up with those dreams but more importantly how does he marry it up with God who God is what is happening to him and then we know he gets sold to Potiphar and um, if I could have the next uh, slide please and uh, we get told that Joseph found favor in the eyes of Potiphar. 
and he became his attendant. And he was actually put in charge of the whole household. And um, Potiphar entrusted everything into his care and didn't have to concern himself with anything because Joseph was there. And I think about that, and I think um, I put this little scripture here from 1 Peter 4. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. Now, again, Joseph didn't know that scripture when he was in that situation. But I think to myself, you know, he didn't just go into Potiphar's household. Boom, he becomes, you know, the head of the, the servants, and he gets given this position of power. What did he do for that to happen? He started to serve, and then he got recognized because he was serving, and he was diligent about what he was doing, and he was faithful about it. And he didn't know that scripture, you know, in, in Ephesians, slaves, you know, obey your masters even when they're not looking. And I think to myself, what did, was Joseph thinking? I think he was thinking, let me just do the next right thing. I don't know what on earth is going on. This is not what I imagined my life to be. I'm just going to put the next foot forward. What's the next good choice to make? What's the next right thing to do? And you know, if you're a slave, you don't serve because you want to. You serve because you have to. And if you don't do what you've been told to do, not suggested or asked to do, but told to do, you're going to get beaten, you could even ultimately get killed. You could get sold uh, to somebody who's even worse. Uh, you know, you do it because you have to. But Joseph was different. He did it because it was, he wanted to. He did it. He started to serve. And how do I know that? Am I guessing? Let's have a look at another scripture. Can I have the next slide, please? So um, I think Angeline mentioned it last week. Potiphar's wife gets the hots for Joseph and she's begging and pleading with him every day to have sex with her. And Joseph says some amazing things which show us his attitude. Uh, his, he refuses and he says, with me in charge, uh, he told her, the master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God. And though she pleads with him again and again and again, he doesn't, he doesn't slip up. And I think to myself, what? This is your slave master you're talking about. And this is, you know, you are in this incredibly unjust situation and you care about your master and you want to honor him? I mean, let's face it, how many of us find it a bit hard to honor the old boss at work, you know? And um, this is far worse. And I think about that, and I think about what would my attitude be if I was Joseph? And, you know, kind of, excuse my French if this is a bit rude, but if Potiphar's wife was um, coming on to me, if I was male, obviously, I'd think, oh, it's a great chance to screw the master over, get my own back. What a great thing. He, he's been making me do this all the time. Let's get one over on him. That's what I would think, I think. What a great opportunity for a bit of revenge. Or I might think, well, what's serving God done me? Nothing. So what does it matter what I do? Does anybody here know me? Does anybody know who, um, anything about God? Does anybody uh, care about me? Why don't I get a little bit of comfort? You know, but he actually somehow he is enslaved, enslaved. Nobody has come, nobody cares, but he realizes that God is there and God is watching him. And actually, he doesn't want to sin against God. Wow. 17 years old, already got that sussed. Obviously, he'll have gone on a few years by the time he's Potiphar's. Um, steward but it's an amazing thing isn't it he doesn't give in to self-pity he doesn't give in to entitlement he doesn't do rebellion he serves and I find that amazing and where does that get him by the way it gets him in prison doesn't it we know the story so if the next slide 
So uh, we get the same account told us that Joseph's put in prison. He then begins to serve. He gets recognized by the warden, and it gets to the place where the warden doesn't have to worry about anything. Joseph's on the, on the job. And I think to myself, um, anybody watch Shawshank Redemption? A few people. I mean, there's a lot of Shawshank before you get the redemption, as I like to say. And there is a lot of Shawshank before we get to the redemption with Joseph's story. And, you know, there's this moment where Andy Dufresne, who's been innocent the whole time, he's been in prison for years, they find absolute proof that he's innocent, and it's not in the warden's interest to let him go because he's doing what the warden needs him to do. And I think to myself, what did this prison warden think? Well, if it, what you'd think he would think if you were Joseph is, can't you see I'm innocent? Can't you see by my integrity and the way I'm living that this is totally wrong? And what you're hoping is he's going to say, my gosh, we need to sort this out. It's absolutely outrageous that this boy is in prison. But no, selfishness reigns. I don't have to worry about anything because Joseph's there. And what do you think Joseph's thinking? Somehow, we don't see it, but there must have been a lot of nights where he was doing that work with God of forgiving, getting rid of resentment, getting rid of offense, you know, dealing with his attitude to God. Where are you, God? What's going on? I did all the right things, you know, and he's doing that hard work and then making that decision. I'll do the next right thing. I'll do the next right thing. I don't understand it, but I'm going to keep on obeying God and doing the next right thing. What a man. And we know the story, don't we? The cupbearer and the baker uh, come into the prison. And I find it astounding that, firstly, that Josh, Joseph cares when he notices that they're looking a bit distressed because I think the thing that wants to really take you out when you're going through it is selfishness and I'm just going to look after me and uh, nobody else is so you just don't have any oomph to, to give to anybody else but he cares about them and he asks them to tell them what's the matter and then believe it or not they've got dreams seriously what do you think his attitude's going to be dreams I'm out of here. Don't tell me about dreams. Yeah? Why bother? Why bother? I had a couple of dreams. Now, I think it's a little bit of insight into what he must have been thinking because he says, tell me your dreams. But he also says, surely the interpretation of dreams belongs to God. So I think he must have been thinking, I know I had those dreams. I thought it meant this. Maybe I got that wrong. I think that must have been something he was thinking. But, and then I love his integrity because great, great to tell the cupbearer, you're going to get restored. You're going to be the cupbearer again. Not so easy to tell the baker you've got three days to live. I think I might have said, oh, I'm not totally sure what that, uh, that one means. Um, but he tells him, doesn't he? So, I mean, what incredible integrity. And um, he lands in the palace, doesn't he? And he's there. To, but just remember... He says to them, please remember me. And it says, he was forgotten. And that's another two years he waited. You think of that pressure on his heart. You think of the pressure to be bitter, to be discouraged, to be disappointed, to give up, to choose to let it all hang out. You know, that pressure to keep believing God and putting your trust in him. It's amazing. It's an amazing pressure. And um, he's in the palace. He gets the opportunity to explain the dream, which is there's going to be seven years of plenty. Then there's going to be seven years of drought. And Joseph says to them, you know, look, you need to be saving food now because another seven years are going to come. It's going to be hard. And he gets put in the position of authority to deal with that. And it's an amazing story. And yeah, those dreams are fulfilled, aren't they? And you can see uh, that he's been put in that place of leadership. But what I love is we get some insight in Genesis as to what Joseph was thinking. And um, can I have the next um, slide? This is a beautiful one, isn't it? 
What an amazing thing to say. He, gets, um, he has two children. His second child is called Ephraim, and Ephraim means God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. It's incredible, isn't it? Wow. And by this time, he's about 30 years old. He's had 13 years of being a slave. And by the way, he doesn't stop being a slave just because he's the um, prime minister sort of role. And I think about that, and we were talking last week about God is a covenant-keeping God, and he's a faithful God. And one of the things we can look at this story, and we can say, it doesn't matter what people do to me. It doesn't matter evil, wicked behavior. It doesn't matter betrayal, jealousy, rivalry, hatred, injustice, bitterness. It doesn't matter what man, the enemy, throws at me. God is faithful. God got him where he wanted him to go. And it's an amazing thing, isn't it? Nothing can stop God. Or can it? Because I think there's one person who could have stopped it, and that's Joseph. If he hadn't had the attitudes that he had and had fought that fight to be that obedient believer of God, I don't think he could have been put in that position. And there's um, an amazing, well, I should say all the scripture's amazing, but I find Hebrews 12 a really amazing scripture and a real encouragement when life is tough. Because uh, we get told that when we're going through it, that we can have a harvest of righteousness and peace, but it says these words, for those who have been trained by it. So we have to make a decision. You know, this doesn't seem to look like God's plan. This doesn't seem to fit with what I thought life was going to be about. This person's behavior to me is outrageous. You know, whatever it is. But I am going to work with God to be trained by it. That's a big step, isn't it? And that, I think, is what Joseph did. So I want us to think about that. It also says that in Hebrews 12, it says something. If you get your head around this, I don't know how you get your head around it, but we need to get our head around it, is that when we go through trials and struggles, we're to see it as God disciplining us. And it says these amazing words. That's him treating us as children. I mean, it really does, to me, mean I've got to recalibrate how I think. Because somehow, when I am going through this stuff, I'm not less loved by God. I'm his child, and he really loves me. And he cares about me so much, he wants to discipline me, and he wants to deal with my character. And he's doing it for my good. So somehow, that has got that whole thing of, I'm doing it wrong, this can't be right, God doesn't love me, he's abandoned me, this doesn't make sense. Somehow my mind has got to change, my heart's got to change of, he loves me. And this is actually, in some way, evidence that he is treating me as his child. That means a big change, I don't know about you, but that is not my first thought. So, um, this key, Hebrews 12 says something else. It says, consider Jesus. And that, to me, is my other top tip. Joseph, at that moment, didn't know Jesus. But we're told to fix our eyes on Jesus and um, to consider how he lived his life. And I just can't stress enough how it's got to be our life is rooted in Jesus, rooted in intimacy with him, relationship with him to get through. But Joseph was able to say, he has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. He recognized God. And he says this other amazing thing. I've got another little scripture that he says. He says to his brothers, when he's finally reconciled with them, he says, you intended to harm me 
But God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And if you think about that, what's Joseph really saying? He's saying he realized his life wasn't about him. I don't like that one too much. <laughs> uh, you know, his life wasn't about him. And he realized the bigger picture, that he was here to serve many and to see many lives saved. And um, I was, when I was thinking about this, I was remembering when I was a little um, life group leader. And uh, one time we were down to just three of us, and that one of the three was me. So we weren't doing too good at the old multiply and grow and all that kind of thing. And I said to my cell group, shall we, we either call it a day or we do something to grow it? And how about we do an alpha course? So we decided to run a little alpha course. We had about four people came to it. And one of them was the lovely Ruth. I don't know if she's out here anywhere, but um, anyway, in our church, Ruth. And um, Ruth came to our Alpha course. A little while after that, she became a Christian, went out to Africa, became a missionary. Incredible story. But part of her um, testimony was that she didn't know God, she didn't believe in him, didn't know if he was real. But she was at a really low ebb just before we um, invited her to this Alpha course. And she'd cried out, and I can't get her words right to test, but it's along the lines of, God, if you're the real, I need you. Please help me. Please save me. Do something to help me. And we didn't know it, but we were a part of the answer to that cry. Yeah, we just thought, we're not doing too well at doing a life group. Uh, let's try an alpha course. But it was an answer to her cry. And each one of us here were an answer to somebody's cry. And Joseph had got that. You intended it for harm. But actually, this was because God had many lives to save. So when I look at the life of Joseph, here are my takeaways from it. I need to see that God, when we're going through tough stuff, is treating me as a child. It's actually evidence of his love, not the contrary. I need to cooperate with him and get trained by it. Because boy, did Joseph get trained and didn't he become trustworthy? I need to fix my eyes on Jesus, who's my example to follow. And I need to do a lot of work on my heart to deal with unforgiveness, to do with resentment, to do with little seeds and darts of doubt and unbelief, entitlement, whatever it is. And I need to be all in. I need to trust Jesus and be all in and believe he has a bigger picture that I don't necessarily see. And it's not about me. I hate that one. <sighs> I really hate that one. So going back to the words of Jesus, I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. Those words, life of Jesus. Well, I think we need to also have these words of Jesus. And he's, these are very famous words. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? So I know from looking at that, if we can keep that up for a little bit longer, that abundant life does not mean selfishness, because I've got to deny myself. So it's not about everything being about me. I know that abundant life is not going to be pain-free because I don't know about you, but taking up my cross doesn't sound too sexy to me. Um, it sounds like there's going to be some pain and there's going to be some suffering in it. And I'm to follow, not myself, but I'm to follow Jesus. So abundant life is going to look like obedience and making the next right decision, no matter how tough it is. And so, what do I think abundant life equals? Well, there's lots of things. I'm sure that scripture means loads more than I'm going to say. But I think it means if we follow Jesus, if we have an attitude of wherever we are, whatever we're doing, we're going to serve him. He will give us a life of incredible purpose and incredible impact that we probably will not know until we get to glory. And you and I get to cooperate with him and be part of his plan 
for this world. That sounds pretty cool to me. Thanks for watching this message. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. To find out more about our church, head to linktr.ee forward slash LifespringUK.